What's up, you guys? So today we're going to go over the problem Pascal's triangle. So it says, given a non-negative integer, num rows, generate the first num rows of Pascal's triangle. In Pascal's triangle, each number is the sum of the two numbers directly above it. So as you can see from the image, we have all of the middle numbers in this triangle are being generated from the two top elements. So let's jump over to the whiteboard and I'll show you guys how we can solve this using dynamic programming. Okay, so we're gonna go over the example that LeetCode provides us. All of the numbers in green are the numbers that we are going to generate. And all of the blue numbers are essentially always going to be ones, specifically all of the numbers on the perimeter of our triangle. And so we need to look at each row as an individual list because in our function, we're going to be returning a list of lists. So each row would be a single list. And if we were to label the indices of each one of these numbers, this would be the zeroth index. This would be 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then finally 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And these green numbers need to be generated by doing the sum of the numbers that are directly above them. So, for example, if we were to look at this number 2, this is generated by looking at this value plus this value, 1 plus 1. And then the number 2 is generated from the left and then the right that is directly above this number. Same thing for here. We have 2 plus 1, that's 3. Right here, right here, and then right here. But always, the start and the end of our list will always be a 1 because that will be the perimeter of our triangle. So how do we actually do this calculation? Let's say that we wanted to generate the row number three. So we have row one, two, three, four, and five, right? To generate row number three, we need to look at our previous row. And this is kind of the basis of what dynamic programming is. In order to make new calculations, we need to look at our previous calculations that we have already computed. So row two in this case would be our previous row, and then row number three would be our current row. And then let's say the number that we're trying to calculate is specifically at index i, okay? So let's say we were trying to generate this number two. So we know we need to look at our previous row, but we need to know which indices to grab. And the way we're gonna perform this calculation is we look at the current value of what our index is. So in this case, i is one. And so we can say one minus one is zero. So we grab that zeroth index from our previous row. And then we also grab the first index. So whatever value i is, we grab that from our previous row and then we just compute the sum. So let me draw this out so it makes more sense. We would say cur at index i is going to be equal to our previous row at index i minus one, right? i minus one would be this zeroth index right here, plus prev at index i. And then that would be for this first index in our previous row. And so this recurrence relation is going to be what we're going to use to calculate each row. And so we also have to keep in mind that we don't want to do this for every element in our list, specifically the start and end of our list, because those values are always going to be one, specifically because they're the perimeter of our triangle. And then one more thing is that we need to handle base cases, right? So we have two base cases, and it specifically comes from row one and row two. As you can see, these numbers are already on the perimeter, so they are set at one no matter what. We do not have to generate any numbers in row one or row two. 
So if we get an input that says, you know, R equals one, then we just need to return a list of one. If we get a row of two, then we need to immediately return a list of one, one. And then anything that is greater than two, this is where this recurrence relation will be used. So let's jump into the code and I'll show you guys how to implement this. So the first thing we want to do is generate a list of lists because that is what we are going to be returning from our function. So we can say list of a list of integer. We can call it result is equal to a new array list. And then we need to iterate over however many rows that we have. So we can start our index at zero and we can go all the way up to num rows minus one. The reason why this starts at zero and goes to num rows minus one is because num rows is actually not zero based. So when we start it at zero and go to num rows minus one, this will still generate all of the rows that we need to. And then inside this for loop, this is where we're going to create the start of our list. So the very start of our list is always going to be a one because that will be the perimeter. So we can say list of integer, just call this list, and we're going to create a new array list with a value of one inside of it. So we can say arrays.asList with just a number one inside of it thus far. And then here is where we are going to perform our recurrence relation. So we can say for int j, and we can start this at one. The reason why we start this at one is because we don't want to get an index out of bounds exception. So we have to make sure that we start the index at one because when we perform our recurrence relation, we're going to say j minus one. So if our j started at zero, then that index would be a negative one, which would break our code. So this will go all the way up to whatever i minus one is. And then we're going to increase j. And then in here, this is where we want to extract our previous row so that we can actually perform our calculation. So we can say list of integer prev is going to be equal to our result dot get i minus one. Because remember, since this function will only run when j is less than i. So this will technically only run when i gets to a value of two, right? And so if we were to do two minus one, that would give us a previous of one, right? So that would be the very first previous row that we calculate. So that's why we always have to make sure that it's i minus one here. And then this is where we just do our calculation. So we can say list.add prev.get j minus one plus prev.get j, right? And then finally, we need to handle the case where we're at the very end of our perimeter. So we only want to do this calculation if i is greater than zero, right? So if i is greater than zero, we can say list.add one. And then we need to add this list that we just calculated on line five to our resulting list. So we can say result.add list and then return our result. So just to make sure that line 10 is easily understood, the reason why we're doing this is because imagine i is actually zero, that would mean that our number of rows that came in was a value of one. And so in the very first row, we only have one number one. But as soon as i gets to one or greater, so specifically this row or forward, 
we have another number one that needs to be added to the end of the list. So that's what line 10 is doing. So let's just make sure that this works. And there we go. So next, I'm going to go over the time and space complexity of our solution. The time complexity of our solution is going to be n squared, where n is the number of rows that we have to generate. In the first for loop on line 10, we have to loop over all of our, the number of rows. And then in the second inner loop on line 12, we have to actually generate that new row. And then as for our space complexity, it's also going to be n squared. And that specifically comes from line number nine. We have to create a list of lists. So that will be our space complexity. So that's it for this problem. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.